Good. I, I, I think I'm unmuted now. Um, can I just echo what Michael said and welcome everyone to this first event of this kind? And can I also say what will be obvious to everyone that none of this would be happening um, were it not for the tremendous efforts of Lee and Michael? Um, so Michael and Lee, thank you both very, very much for doing this. And new event, and it's fun. Um, our speaker this evening is Lillian Elliott, and let me just introduce her briefly. Lillian Elliott is a third year research student in the School of History of Art at the University of Edinburgh. And she, she's doing this research with um, funding from the Chicago Scots Harper Brown Scholarship and the Ruth Elizabeth Southworth Scholarship. And she also has support from the Kappa Alpha Theta Foundation. Lillian's PhD thesis is trying to look at the relationship between Sir Walter Scott's literary reputation and the visual and material culture of 19th century Britain. So as we'll hear, she places Scott's work against the background of theatre and stage scenery, development in illustrations, cross-cut, wood engraving, portraits, reenactment, dressing up, antiquarians, social change, and fast-moving politics. Now, Lillian holds an MA in Modern Art History, Theory and Criticism from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and a BA in Art History and European Studies from DePaul University in Indiana. And before she began her doctoral study, Lillian worked in museum education and the Department of Prints and Drawings at the Art Institute of Chicago. And she currently holds a position as an online instructor in art history for the University of Texas at El Paso and Youngstown University. Um, Lillian's, uh, Lillian's um, lecture this evening is entitled The Waverley Phenomenon and the Material Imagination. Um, Lillian, we really welcome you and thank you very much indeed for coming. Um, so welcome and please could you begin your presentation. Hi everyone, can you just wave your hand to signal that we're all set and you can hear me? Lovely, wonderful. Well, as um, Ian just relayed, my name is Lillian and I'm a third year postgraduate research student in the School of History of Art at the University of Edinburgh. Before I begin, I just want to take a moment to thank each of you tuning in from their home or office space this evening. Current pandemic situation aside, I don't typically get the chance to discuss my research and writing with such a concentrated group of Scott scholars and enthusiasts. So this invitation on behalf of the organizers, um, again, in particular Lee and Michael, um, and my advisor Penny Fielding and the Edinburgh Sir Walter Scott Club are greatly appreciated. And I hope that what I present is of interest to you all. I'd like to begin my lecture this evening with the following item found in the Bridgman Art Library in London, an engraved sketch which appeared in the 1664th issue of the Illustrated London News on Saturday, 12th of August, 1871. Entitled A Dream of the Waverley Novels, this image was one of roughly 30 full page illustrations produced for the Illustrated London News in the summer months of 1871, which sought to pictorialize the legacy of famed author Sir Walter Scott on the 100th anniversary of his birth. The Scott centenary was a landmark occasion observed across numerous towns and cities in Britain and North America. 
Aside from the annual international exhibition of arts and industries, this event received more coverage in the English speaking periodical press of 1871 than the wedding of Princess Louise, Duchess of Argyle and the Paris Commune combine. Parades, festivals, art exhibitions, costume balls, theater, local assemblies, and all sorts of things honoring the beloved poet and the author of Waverly were far flung and wide reaching. This commemorative strain reached a high point in the national festival in celebration of the centenary of the birth of Sir Walter Scott, which took place in the city center of Edinburgh, Scotland over three weeks and attracted some 12,000 participants. When we take into consideration the fact that by 1871, Scott had already been dead for nearly 50 years. The currency of his celebrity and the culture climate of the English speaking world at this moment in time is striking. It begs the question, what exactly did Scott mean to the 19th century? Picking up where contemporary modes of assessment left off, this I would argue is where the work of the art historian comes into play, examining sectors of popular print, portraiture, material artifacts, visual entertainment and public media, we can evaluate the then prevailing conceptions of the author's literary authority in a manner that both complements and builds on the tradition of literary criticism, the dominant standard of study in the field of Scott scholarship for over a century. Interestingly enough, art history rarely, if ever, enters into conversations regarding the reception history of Scott and the Waverley novels. This might seem understandable. Why study the image and influence of one of Britain's most prolific writers any other way than through the texts upon which he attained national, indeed international status? It's only when confronted with curious images and illustrations, even artifacts such as the ones shown here that a case for the visual and material afterlife of the author becomes evident. I use this term in reference to the work of Scott scholars, Anne Rigney and Nicola J. Watson, two of only a handful of individuals within the sphere of literary studies today who have drawn attention to the manner in which both Scott and his literary corpus were subject to and inspired countless modes of artistic production and consumerism in the 19th century in Britain. Here, the literary life and practice of the author took on a new and ever expanding corpora of identity, in addition to showing the fluidity of stances with which 19th century readers made sense of and came into contact with the figure of Walter Scott. What we can infer from the gleanings of this rich media ecology are the various strands which comprised and fed into Scott's cultural phenomenon, disentangling and at the same time engaging with just a few of these fields of activity. I hope to show you this evening how, in conjunction with a study of texts, we can use art history as a tool to calibrate what shaped literary celebrity of Scott in the 19th century and made him a formidable presence and point of reference in visual and material culture. One, and arguably the most distinctive feature of Scott explored in 19th century evaluation, was the repertoire of historical images and character portraits established in the Waverly Canon. Scott, as I suspect most of us know already, was an effusive storyteller. His belief in the creative continuity between life, literature, and art began with a career in poetry and ballad writing, where paying special attention to descriptive imagery in his work, the author won the favor of the reading public in Britain for his energetic and highly colored representations of historical life and subject matter. The impetus of his early writing, Scott once explained in a historical note from 1819, was the quote, conjuring of images through words, end quote, reminiscing on the process by which his literary productions came to fruition. The author explained how, quote, Weary with ransacking my own barren and bounded imagination, I looked out for some general subject in the huge and boundless field of history, bedezened it with coloring, ornamented it, and invested it with such shade of character 
as would best present to the reading public a lively and fictitious picture, end quote. One time, this poetic tradition transitioned into a novelistic enterprise, in the din of bagpipes, a history of castle architecture and great halls, wood beam taverns and rocky glens to moonlit trails and smoke choked back alleys, costumes, objects, furniture, even hairstyle, a finely drawn world of historical individuals, stories and spheres loom large in the Waverly novels and catapulted Scott's distinction in the literary firmament as a pictorial writer. One can venture to guess that this is the prevailing viewpoint taken in T. Woolnoth and J. Hawksworth's engraving of the author from 1826. In this work, a lavish Gothic border with ivy and escutcheons depicting scenes from the poetry of Scott ornament his half portrait. It extrapolates from the claim made by literary critic and Whig reformist Lord Francis Jeffrey that the minstrel of the North was the most brilliant literary portraitist of his age, one whose, quote, animated and engaging exposition of the manners and state of past society, end quote, presented to readers the same, quote, truth and vivacity of coloring, end quote, as paint to canvas. This pictorialism, compounded by the sheer exhaustiveness of Scott's literary imagination, gave rise to more concrete visions of historical spheres and subject matter in Britain. Scott wrote a staggering 27 novels in 18 years, not to mention nine metrical romances, five editions of collected balladry, and over 50 book projects in history and prose fiction, with topics ranging chronologically from ancient Byzantium all the way to modern European history, his literary outpouring offered artists and craftsmen a wealth of original material. The engraving A Dream of the Waverly Novels illustrates the pictorial repertory associated with his body of works. Here we see historical characters, period clothing and landscape, each taken from a unique chapter in the literary corpus of Scott, coalesce in the space of a single page. Looking at the composition, the expression, great Scott, certainly comes to mind. But what I find intriguing about this print is the letterpress which accompanies it. The writer posits, quote, having read the admirable stories to the many volumes of Scott's novels, the viewer will have no difficulty in identifying all the characters or figures represented, end quote. He continues, quote, We'll leave the reader to their unassisted contemplation for all that concerns the subjects and incidents associated with the author of Waverley are long to be remembered and therefore recognizable even at a glance." End quote. Recognizable even at a glance. Well, this is of course merely one take on Scott, but it elucidates the component to his literary celebrity which 19th century readers and reviewers of Scott in the Waverly novels enthused over and expatiated on in their critical valuation of the author many times over. According, according to historian Thomas Carlyle, the quote, singular vividness, end quote, with which Scott wrote about the historical past ranked him among the chief wonders of the Western world. His force and clarity of description, Carlyle argued, dazzled readers where previous modes of historiographical expression and novel writing in the English literary tradition failed. In his memorials of 1856, Lord Henry Cokeburn similarly described the appeal of Scott as a, quote, graphic force and universal sensation, end quote, extolling his ability to bring history out of obscurity and into popular consciousness through writing English essayist and literary critic William Hazlitt labeled the author the amanuensis of history. In a retrospective essay on the author of Waverley published in 1825, he asserted, quote, this author has only to describe and everywhere his material speaks, breathes and lives again. Whatever he transfers to the pages of his fiction, we see, hear and feel with untired interest, end quote. It's worth noting that 
While Carlisle, Coke, Byrne, and Hazlitt were referencing the extraordinary impact that Scott's writing had on the 19th century reading public, implicit to its mass cultural response for the varieties of artistic adaptation, image making, and media consumption derived from it. This is exactly what is shown in the image before you, taken from the same issue of the Illustrated London News on the 12th of August, 1871. This illustration showcases an exhibition of portraits and material artifacts associated with Scott and the Waverley novels which featured as a point of attraction in the national festival and celebration of the centenary of the birth of Sir Walter Scott at the Royal Academy in Edinburgh. Evidence for the vigor and vitality Scott bestowed to the subjects and subject matter of his fiction can be seen in other illustrative works from the Scott centenary too. This is one of my personal favorites, an oil painting by Victorian genre artist, Charles Hunt, Entitled Ivanhoe, the image, like the previous engravings shown, signals Scott's unique capacity to bring history and its visual material aspects into view. Ivanhoe, one of the most critically acclaimed of the Waverly novels in Scott's day, is shown here as a children's game, thus reviving the contention of one 19th century literary critic for the Christian observer, who in 1832 asserted, quote, the images and recollections drawn up in the Waverley novels are now indispensable pieces of furniture in every corner of every home in the British Empire, end quote. Hunt would certainly seem to underscore this point in his use of child actors, common to the painterly depiction of Victorian middle-class life, the ease with which these rosy-cheeked figures play out a scene from one of the Waverley novels clues us into the 19th century familiarity with Scott. Importantly, Hunt associates Ivanhoe with a domestic interior, thus showcasing the extent to which the book and many of the Waverley novels saturated public and private consciousness, as well as the visual material complexion of things in everyday life. <clears throat> At center, we see two boys reenact the famed tournament scene from the novel. Ivanhoe, a youth dressed in old infantry uniform and feathered helmet, sits staunchly astride a makeshift steed, while his adversary, Brian de bois Gilbert, a sweet-faced boy with unkept hair and painted mustache, topples backward off an upturned chair. Moving beyond the literary associations depicted in this particular figural arrangement, we might also consider the significance of the discarded book pictured in the lower foreground of the painting Ivanhoe and the two reading boys located at right. In possession of what we can assume are too small, feasibly abridged, juvenile, or perhaps even cast off adult versions of the novel Ivanhoe, these figures reference the currency of Scott within the mass cultural circuit of print in the 19th century in Britain. As Richard J. Hill has shown, the repertoire of historical images and character portraits established in the Waverley Canon was eagerly taken up within the commercial movements of this industry. As early as the late 1810s and early 1820s, the poetry and novels of Scott began to appear in collected tranched down and illustrated editions. This placed Scott in the hands of an ever widening literary audience, middling to monarchical. Moreover, as a consequence of increased specialization in print technology and the book trade in the early 19th century, <laughs> the Waverly novels made their way into chat books, picture books, keepsakes, illustrated subscription series, standalone works, and supplementary print. From this substantial body of secondary texts and images then arose an equally substantial outpouring of visual and material adaptations. What began as a distinctly literary phenomenon thus extended itself into the framework of Victorian life, leisure, and domestic performativity. The items shown here represent just a few of the many products and commercial spin-offs derived from the Waverly Canon, some of which likely made their way into the type of middle-class household or domestic interior Charles Hunt's children belonged to 
in the painting Ivanhoe. This leads into another point of discussion in my lecture, separate but related to the pictorialism of Scott's writing. Further to the 19th century valuation of Scott was a keen public interest in getting to know the visual and material foundations upon which the Waverley novels were authored. Who was the man behind such, quote, rich and varied graphical productions, end quote, questioned London Magazine in a review of The Pirate in 1822. To what, quote, external imagery or machinery, end quote, did their author creator turn to place his, quote, effective compilation of material, end quote, so vividly before the eyes. We might recall that prior to 1827, all of the fictional works of Scott, aside from his metrical romances, were simply known as the fictional works of the author of Waverley. The question of Scott's authorship, by extension, the origins of the Waverley novels, has played a role in cementing his celebrity to the reading public the author of Waverley wasn't just a literary worthy. He was the great unknown, a kind of romantic virtuoso and creative wellspring hidden from the world at large, but tantalizingly, ever increasingly on the verge of public discovery. The images and newspaper clippings shown here represent the currency of this thread across 19th century discourse. In particular, the satirical print located at center pokes fun at the rampant interest in the figure of the great unknown. In this print, a caricatured version of the author of Waverley does battle over the biographical rights of Napoleon Bonaparte with the Duke of Wellington, the victorious commander of the British-led Allied army at Waterloo. His juxtaposition with two of the most famed and inquired after personalities of the day in Britain here, uh, <clears throat> Oops, lost my place. The uh, thus conveys his status as a cultural mainstay. Further to the right, in a frontispiece engraving for the 1825 publication, illustrations of the author of Waverley being notices and anecdotes of character, scenes and incidents described in his work, we see a similarly comic but incisive take on the anonymity of the author located beneath a half portrait of a partially concealed figure of the great unknown. A Latin inscription by Tacitus reads, quote, that which is unseen shines the brighter, end quote. Aware of the promotional value of anonymity, Scott played into the public interest in this figure, where using a stratagem of carefully constructed displays of material self-fashioning and public performance, he advertised his link to the Waverley novels and at the same time obfuscated it in myriad ways. This excited the curiosity and interest of 19th century readers in Britain and in time became a prominent point of focus in the media ecology which pictorialized his legacy. With questions surrounding the character and occupational history of the author of Waverley, frequently making an appearance in the popular print of the early 19th century in Britain, as well as the literary and cultural constituencies to which it catered. Abbotsford, the home of Scott from the year 1811 until his death in 1832, became especially important to the 19th century treatment of his literary life and practice. It was here that many intimates, colleagues, and admirers of the author first bore witness to the secret of his identity, for those less familiar with the private life of Scott, it provided a point of speculation. The success of his poetry in the Waverley novels enabled Scott to pour vast amounts of income into the creation and expansion of Abbotsford House. Over a period of 13 years, the home transformed from a modest border farmhouse into an extravagant Scottish baronial manor. Scott frequently referred to the Abbotsford and its state and its holdings as the Delilah of his imagination. His flibberty gibbet and Patmos, paradise, romance of house, the least of all possible dwellings. That the built environment of the home was envisioned by its author inhabitant as a kind of monument to his creative outpouring was signaled by the range of artifacts, ornaments, and images cluttering Abbotsford with references to history and romance scattered almost universally across the building and furnishings of the home. 
The sharpened sense of literary association there generated the assumption that it was here that the great unknown, the author of Waverly, lived and worked. To visit Abbotsford, therefore, was to gain access to the world Scott recreated through literature. The home became a popular tourist destination in Britain and a literary landmark well before Scott admitted authorship of the Waverly novels in 1827. People found their way via coach and paddle steamer, but increasingly through the mediation of books, illustration and travel literature, they visited Abbotsford virtually through variant forms of printed media. This is what is shown in the collection of early 19th century travel publications, pictured at left and to the right, a series of stereoscopic images made and marketed by Scottish photographer, George Washington Wilson. Moving left to right, we see photographic images of the Abbotsford entrance hall, the study of Scott, the Abbotsford library and the armory. In another printed piece from 1832, line engraver John Burnett copied and redistributed William Allen's hugely successful oil painting for the Royal Academy exhibition of 1831, portrait of Sir Walter Scott in his study at Abbotsford. In this image, decorative, architectural, and antiquarian elements from across the built environment of Abbotsford are rearranged to create the impression of a working environment saturated in the sensual texture of times past. Scott, we see, sits contentedly engrossed with a weathered manuscript by Mary Queen of Scots in hand. He's surrounded by layers of drapery, carpet, animal fur, books, parchment paper, metal goods, and antique weaponry. How this surfeit of visual and material resources will factor into and enhance the historical fabric of the Waverley novels as thus proffered for inquiry. This same invitation to engage with Abbotsford's many points of literary and historical association is offered in the title page engraving of the Abbotsford edition of the Waverley novels. Looking at the print, a trove of curiosities belonging to Scott and his vast collection at Abbotsford lies scattered before the mouth of a Gothic entryway. Tartan garments, weaponry, and other antique assortments suffuse the scene in a picturesque manner, allowing the eyes and imagination to wander from one object to the next. To the left, Scott's deerhound may down a gaggle of smaller pups devotedly if somewhat distractedly keep watch over the museal assemblage. Their inclusion in the scene alerts the viewer to the layer of domestic association implicated in the Waverly Canon. Scott, it is rhetorized here, is at home with the relics and remains of history, both literally and figuratively speaking. As preface to his text, Abbotsford registers in this engraving the site of his self-made genius, the very place where history and the stuff of the Waverly novels are breathed, as it were, into life. In time, the signification of Abbotsford became synonymous with the national historical inflection of Scott and the Waverly novels, too. This became key to the author's reception in the 1820s onward, as his literary life and practice were gradually and at length more intricately bound to Scottish cultural heritage. Early in his literary career, Scott popularized the regional landscape and historical settings of Scotland with his narrative poems, such as Lay the Last Minstrel, Marmion, and Lady the Lake, with other early written works, such as Minstrelsy of the Scottish Border and the Provincial Antiquities and Picturesque Scenery of Scotland, he revitalized Scottish antiquarianism as well as the fading oral traditions of Scottish folklore and balladry. The graphic style of writing, which typified the literary output of Scott, not only glamorized real life localities and communities across Scotland, but also charged them with enough human drama and visual appeal as to contribute to a major growth in the practice of Scottish landscape art, fashion, and literary tourism. Moreover, Following his recovery of the Scottish regalia and high profile role in the visit of George IV to Scotland in 1822, these activities all but confirmed popular suspicion in Britain that Scott was, in fact, the author of Waverley. 
this physical and cerebral existence at Abbotsford House mirrored the delineative aspects of Scottish life, language, events, characters, and scenery in the Waverley novels, making him and the assessment of Edinburgh publisher and politician Adam Black a patrimonial figure of cultural Scottishness. William Holm Lazars captures this sense of the nation forming authority figure in Scott in his decorative etching from 1840 entitled Abbotsford. Here we see pastoral images of Melrose and Drybra Abbey, two purportedly unmissable destinations in what Scott called the classic ground of his native homeland, linked in an elaborate pictorial triptych with Abbotsford House, thus indicating the import of Scott as part of a network of cultural and scopic productions reifying Scottish cultural heritage. Correspondingly, in an 1849 oil painting created by Scottish artist Thomas Fade, an imaginary gathering of Scottish luminaries from James Hogg, Sir David Wilkie, Adam Ferguson, John Wilson, Henry Mackenzie, and Lord Byron cluster around the seated figure of the author of Waverley in the center of the library at Abbotsford House. These figures of literary, historical, and artistic repute appear to confer with the so-called patriarch of Scottish national sentiment, providing a graphic equivalent to the description of John Gibson Lockhart, who writing 1837 asserted, quote, Whoever had Scottish blood in him, gentle or simple, felt it move more rapidly through his veins when in the presence of Scott, end quote. Abbotsford became the place to pay tribute to this national historical phenomenon and importantly, partake in the process of national historical protection and perpetuation Scott championed there through literature. A scan of the art and object scape of Abbotsford, however brief, reveals a national ethos imbricated in the network of literary and historical associations there. This was by Scott's design, but over the years it became an integral component to the 19th century construction of his legacy. Images and illustrations of the Scottish collection of art and architecture, personalia, books, and curios at Abbotsford pervaded a variety of artistic genres throughout visual and material culture. The exterior of the house, for instance, appealed to 19th century viewers as a recycling of Scottish heritage items from the Roman occupation in the first century AD to the Middle Ages, Reformation, and early modern era. A two-story crenellated gateway and portcullis modeled defensive architecture of the Scottish border, while notched gable ends, bartisans, clustered chimney and windstones replicated identifiable features of Fivey, Lorston, Buchanan, Dunrobin, and Linlithgow Castle. Other visible nods to Scottish history included gargoyles and spolia salvaged from recently demolished architectural landmarks in the border vicinity. Detailed consideration of this material is provided in a series of illustrated wood engravings produced by the London firm of English printmaker William Dix. In the images shown at left, we see an 1842 illustration of the door of the Old Toll booth of Edinburgh, which adorned a second story wall of the eastern facing facade of Abbotsford. This display drew the attention of many, not only for its peculiar placement on the outer reaches of the home, but also for the parallels it bore to the historical content of Scott's seventh novel, The Heart of Midlothian. In another illustration from 1842, shown at right, we see a garden well, Scott built out of salvaged bits and pieces from the ruins of Melrose Abbey. The resonance of this work to 19th century viewers lay in its connection to the setting of Scott's 1805 narrative poem, Lay of the Last Minstrel. Meanwhile, the interior of Abbotsford House functioned as a purpose-built space for national historical exhibition too. During Scott's lifetime, this famously object-laden terrain was pegged by 19th century visitors, both real and virtual, as a museum for living in. 
in the entrance hall, for instance, Scott installed wood paneling from Dunfermline Abbey, marble floor tiles from the Hebrides, animal skulls, mounts and pelts from the Scottish Highlands, and a grand fireplace modeled, modeled after the abbot seat of Melrose Abbey. This was joined by coats of arms and shields celebrating eminent Scottish border clans, and from floor to ceiling, a riot of antiquarian curiosities, including a cast of the skull of Robert the Bruce, medieval torture implements, weaponry, and two semicircular wood presses made from the fragments of the pulpit of famed Scottish minister and dissenter Ebenezer Erskine. Other public rooms at Abbotsford House, such as the armory, library, and drawing room were similarly themed and structured. Scottish history looked out from its walls, observed one 19th century literary tourist, enveloping the modern visitor and providing a means for engaging with the national historical past, not unlike the historical materiality which characterized the Waverley novels. It was by this logic that by 1832, Abbotsford attained an institutional footing in Britain comparable to what we now might call a national historical monument or repository, enclosed within one space outside of time and away from susceptibility to neglect, mismanagement or ruin, the built environment of the home, 19th century assessment, offered easy access and cultural longevity to the storied remains of Scottish national history. Synonymous with the literary life and practice of the author of Waverley, it elicited a discourse about the, quote, proud immortality, end quote, Scott conferred to art and material artifacts there through the process of fiction writing. In fact, many 19th century literary devotees and visitors to Abbotsford came with the express purpose of donating Scottish heritage items to Scott and the Abbotsford collection. The hope being that in addition to seeing the place where the Waverley novels were planned and penned, they could facilitate in its project. The Highland broadsword pictured at the top of the slide shown here was given to Scott by the Celtic Society of Edinburgh in 1826. This was joined by an ornately carved chair given to Scott in 1822 by Scottish antiquarian Joseph Train. The provenance of the piece, according to Train, was linked to the scene and eventual rest of William Wallace in a town outside of Glasgow in 1305. Similarly, one Gabriel Alexander sent to Scott a pair of 17th century thumb screws associated with the Scottish National Covenant. His reasoning behind such a bizarre and grisly gift, he explained in a letter to Scott in 1819, was the author's status as, quote, best and most legitimate custodian of all that is national, end quote. So important was this conception of the body of art and antiquities at Abbotsford that when Scott faced bankruptcy in 1826, his creditors decided to allow him to keep the house and its collection within a private trust where revenue was acquired from the proceeds of his writing. Abbotsford and the national historical legacy of Scott were from then on inextricably linked in the public eye. The author's home not only symbolized the success its creator had achieved through writing, but also the service he performed there, collecting, communicating, and safeguarding Scottish cultural heritage for perpetuity. In the years following 1832, this desire to pay homage to the literary life and practice of Scott at Abbotsford fell into decline. Illustrative work and material adaptations of the author's home remained a steady industry in Britain well until the 20th century. But the practice of making the physical trek to Abbotsford House, touring its halls and leaving some mark of readerly admiration there for its author inhabitant to retain and care for lessened. This was simply due to the fact that Scott was dead and the erratic pull which originally instilled the experience and understanding of the house and grounds there was gone. To commemorate Scott and in turn latch on to the cultural capital of his writing through gift giving, it was determined that a more durable, more publicly accessible testament to collective pride in the author was needed. Not 10 days after Scott's death, on the 5th of October, 1832, 
a gathering of roughly 100 intimates, colleagues, friends, and admirers of the author assembled in the hall of the Royal Institution in Edinburgh and formed a formal committee for, quote, the erection of some lasting monument of gratitude and imperishable esteem for one of Scotland's most honored sons, end quote. It would take another 14 years, countless meeting minutes, a design competition, door-to-door -door fundraising, and over 16,000 pounds in subscription fees to create the Scott Monument, which resides on Princess Street in Edinburgh, Scotland, and to this day dominates the city landscape. The history and building of this structure is a complex one, and all the ins and outs of its formal configuration certainly provide us with a more palpable sense of the indebtedness 19th century readers, artists, and consumers felt for the literary life and practice of Scott. As I come towards the close of my lecture this evening, I merely want to reflect on its example as a metaphor for the media ecology which shaped Scott's celebrity. Elements from across the reception history of Scott and the Waverley novels, for instance, are showcased in the construction of the Scott Monument. It features four separate viewing platforms, a second story chapel and museum space, stained glass windows, Gothic arches and niches, which house the statues of over 64 characters and historical persons illuminated in the Waverley canon. Elsewhere, architectural nods to Melrose Abbey, Roslyn Chapel, and other prominent Scottish la national landmarks featured in the writing of Scott comprise the building, foundation, and tower of the monument. These visual and material components not only recall the rich historical texture and pictorialism which pervaded the Waverley novels, but also the impact they had on the reading public in Britain concretizing cultural Scottishness and effectively bringing its storied material out of obscurity and into view. In closing, it's this embodiment of the visual and material imagination which comprised and fed into the cultural phenomenon that was Scott, which I think makes the Scott Monument such a compelling testimonial, an appropriate place to end my lecture this evening. Sitting at the center of the monument under its towering canopy of literary and historical details, the Maud Shroud figure of Walter Scott. His statue is twice life size and carved in white Carrara marble. Despite the colossal frame and costly material with which this statue towers over the spectator, they, I think there, well, I think there's an element of warmth and approachability to the figure of Scott in this particular representation. The author, who historian Thomas Carlyle once dubbed King of the Romantics, sits in an easy upright posture, comfortably tucked under his border tartan with one of his trademark canine companions underfoot. With a closed book in hand, it's not clear whether Scott has just taken his seat or is momentarily interrupted. One way or the other, he looks up from his reading material, a contemplative expression spread across his face. Looking out over the Edinburgh expanse and more broadly the national historical train before him, the seated author of Waverley reminds us that it is here, amongst the storied vistas and prospects of the Scottish backcloth, a continuum of historical materiality, old world relics and living songs where he's most at home. Taking into consideration the varieties of art, image making and media consumption looked at this evening, overlaid with this sweeping prospect, we arrive at a version of Scott not unlike the one with which this lecture began. We see an author whose creative outpouring defies disciplinary barriers. As the letterpress for the 1871 engraving, A Dream of the Waverly Novels suggests, we see a quote, prodigy of fertility, end quote, one who leaves in his wake a whole world of romantic incarnations, brilliant, borderless, and great. And that is my lecture.
um, Lillian, that was absolutely wonderful. And thank you very, very much. I mean, thoroughly enjoyable. Um, can I just, in a sense, to sort of kick off questions, can I begin with an observation and then ask uh, a real question, if I may? The, the observation, um, you referred to, um, to Washington Wilson, and um, Washington Wilson died in 1893, and University of Aberdeen, for example, has a huge collection of his early photographs. And um, the, the early photographs, for example, show social gathering. A, a lot of, they, they show lots of views of buildings and scenes, but they also show social gatherings where people um, have performed tableaus and tableaus, you know, are often drawn from Walter Scott, recreating scenes. And they're fun. Um, here's, here's the question, um, uh, and beginning with an analogy, in, in 1560 there was a new translation of the Bible, the, the so-called Geneva Bible, which was the version of the Bible used by the Pilgrim Fathers and by Shakespeare. And the Geneva Bible was a very lively publication and it went through literally dozens and dozens of editions. It had two major typefaces, black letter and Roman. Um, it was bundled with different material. They had different woodcuts. It was aimed deliberately at different reading publics. So people who were less educated tended to read the black letter and they had different stuff bundled with it. And so the, the evolution of the Bible in English actually goes hand in hand with the evolution of these many different editions and the fact that they were also priced very differently. And as, as you were speaking, and I was you know, really intrigued, um, can you say anything about the material history of the publishing phenomenon, the, the cost, um, as, as it were, cost coming down, the increasing illustration, and then how that filtered out into ever widening circles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an absolutely phenomenal question. And actually, I had a student ask me about it <laughs> just earlier this week. So <laughs> luckily, I'm already primed to answer it. But um, yeah, I would say I'm, I'm particularly struck with your choice of the word packaging, right? Because that is essentially what was happening in, in the case of Scott and in the instance of, of the Bible that you're referring to. It's this packaging and repackaging and translating and parsing and redistributing of one particular type of text. Um, as an art historian, I'm, I tend to lean more towards the sort of material adaptations of Scott's work, but obviously like illustration was huge, hugely important to the dissemination of his work. And I'm gonna botch the date on this, but Scott's works were being illustrated, you know, before he was even a novelist. So his poetry was being illustrated and then as the Waverly novels began to come out, um, his publishers decided to come out with a scheme of first publishing edited editions of the Waverly novels with a single illustration in them, right? And, and those would have been considerably expensive for a 19th century consumer. So, in that instance, those weren't particularly catering to, um, I guess you could say like middle class or lower class audiences. However, um, you know, the phenomenal thing about print in the 19th century was there wasn't, copyright was obviously not this concrete established thing. And so oftentimes, um, 
you would get pirated editions of the Waverly novels and um, chat books were hugely popular and chat books were very, very affordable. I think chat books could be anything from a shilling to a few shillings and often, more often than not included illustrations. So again, it's this idea of um, making Scott's work more accessible to the audiences that we wouldn't typically conceive of um, 19th century literary culture. Um, so chat books were re really big. And then sort of alongside um, these, these publishing schemes that started in the early 1820s with including like a few illustrations or engravings of images from the Waverly novels in within each published book. Um, I believe it was Robert Cadell, don't quote me on that, but they came up with a scheme to sell illustrations separately from the text. Um, and that was also hugely successful because it, again, opened, opened the availability of the Waverly novels to a completely different audience. And oftentimes what would happen is um, attendant to the illustration itself was a, a little clipping of text from one of the Waverly novels. And um, so people were sort of immersing themselves in the literature that way. And um, it was sort of briefly alluded to at the um, beginning of my lecture, but theater was of course another really um, significant way in which people were being exposed to Scott's work and um, were sort of becoming literate um, to Scott's texts. Um, I would almost put theater in the same category as chat books. It was just as, as cheap, again, a few shillings. So uh, remarkable when we think about I don't know. I think, I think one Waverly novel in like 1830 was 30, 31 shillings or something. I mean, very expensive, but many, many people were being exposed to his work through these three theatrical productions or, you know, it, perhaps when they were leaving the theater, they could pick up a chat book on a street corner. Um, yeah. So it, it, <sighs> It's very much a, a phenomenon of lots and lots of things happening all at once. As you said, again, a sort of repackaging um, in lots of different materials and um, public formats. So yeah, I think that addressed the question. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now, at this point, thank you very much, um, uh, Sir Ian, for your opening question. Um, unfortunately, you have to put up with me now for um, the rest of chairing questions, see if anything comes in. But um, would, has anyone else got a further question they'd like to ask a little bit in? Oh, I see Brainbridge. I shall ask to unmute you. And uh, there we go. Oh, you're still muted. Sorry, Anton. How's that? Perfect. <laughs> oh, good. Um, I recall right at the beginning of Alice in Wonderland that Alice says, what is the use of a book with no pictures or conversations in it? Um, and, and it's true, isn't it? My, my copy of the Waverley novels is the 1890s border edition with the wonderful introduction by Andrew Lang, um, uh, and each of them are copiously illustrated to a variety of levels of quality, I have to say, sometimes mm. bearing little relationship to what one's reading, um, but ranging all the way to the superb quality of some of them, um, uh, particularly I'm thinking of The Heart of Midlothian, I guess. Um, but uh, quite often you come across copies which, do, which have no illustrations, paperback versions of the Waverley novels, for example, which mm. still sell, Pe Penguins still sell, I'm glad to say, but no illustrations, generally speaking. Um, to what extent do readers nowadays 
and I'm talking about the 21st century readers whom we hope to attract back to Scott. Um, to what extent do modern readers require illustrations to help them into the book, do you think? Oh, that's a wonderful question. Oh, and I'm not sure I'll be able to answer it adequately, <laughs> but I'm going to I'm going to kind of go around this. I'm going to answer it sort of indirectly. I sadly enough, I I don't think that many people are reading the Waverly novels these days. However, I know, I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> however, however, my interest in them as an art historian is that they are in fact still quite relevant. It's just that we are consuming the I suppose you could say the content or the quality or their ideas through visual material culture. So I would argue that, oh, I'm, let me think of an example. Um, well, is anyone, fam this is a terrible example, but is anyone familiar with the t television show Outlander? Or, um, uh, let me go further back. Maybe the movie Brigadoon, the old Hollywood movie Brigadoon. These are all um, sort of visual tropes or visual characterizations of the, the Waverly novels that um, we, we carry with us. And as an American, it's, it's particularly interesting because when I moved here, that's what I expected. <laughs> you sort of expect the cobbled streets and the mossy rocks and the billowing mists and you sort of expect to be transported back in time and I think that sense of romanticism and that um, kind of nostalgia began with Scott and it began with the Waverly novels, right? He's the one that sort of established that visual and material precedent in popular culture and in our conceptualization of what Scotland is or what it's like to experience. And so I guess I would say, I guess illustrations don't matter. <laughs> <laughs> to to the Waverly novels today because they're being carried out in other ways in, in popular culture that are completely separate from the texts. So I and and actually to me I find that sort of problematic. Um, my interest is again going back in time and seeing how all of these things were sort of coming together and coalescing at the same time. Whereas today they've sort of been separated again. Um, and I, which is why I don't think that many people read the way <laughs> But yeah, so I guess, no, I, I, I don't think it's that important. Um, on the other hand, my first encounter with the Waverly novels was as a child. Um, going through some of my grandfather's books and they were um i think it was the library edition of the waverly novels so again like very densely illustrated and as a child i i found that fascinating and, and immersive and just wildly interesting um but I'm not sure as adults, it's like we've separated ourselves from that sort of sense of awe and wonderment that sort of get it as a child. And um, yeah, I'm not sure it's ne necessary. Anthony, do you want to follow up on, on, on Lillian's response or? I, 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 I entirely agree with her. First of all, it's obvious that not many people do read the Waverley novels, and it's their loss, of course, um, because, we, because we love them. Uh, but I'm wondering to what extent, uh, behind my question was the wonder, the query about to what extent a fully illustrated set, a new, I, I mean, uh, the new Edinburgh edition, for example, which I haven't 
handled, I must admit, they're too expensive for me to put on my bookshelf. Uh, do they contain illustrations? I, I rather doubt it. No. Um, yeah. Uh, and I just wonder to what extent if they were a more affordable and b illustrated, some uh, somewhat a younger reader might be inclined to stick with it rather than going to something um, uh, some some more modern and illustrated as mm -hmm. like as not mm -hmm. literature. I, I don't know. It's a, it's an open question. I agree, mm -hmm. but I do know that my attraction to the border edition in the nineteen sixties. I bought the complete edition of the Border Edition, uh, all 24 volumes for four pounds, 10 shillings in a, in a second hand bookshop in Birmingham. Uh, and it still has pride of place on my bookshelf. And I still read mm -hmm. it. Ills illustrations and all. <laughs> Thank you. Lovely, do we have any, um, any further questions from anyone at the moment? Oh. Lucy, if you could unmute yourself and I'll spotlight you and fire away. Well, well first of all, uh, thank you ever uh, so much, Lillian. That was a, a really fascinating talk, so, so thank you. Um, I just wondered, I was struck, I've been struck in the past and I was struck during your, um, your talk there when you were showing a couple of the sort of title pages or images that um, bring together either you know, myriads of Scott's characters or some of the objects, antiquarian objects and the objects that are in novels, sort of bringing them together in a strange um, assemblage on the title page. And it, it just reminded me of, of many of uh, the title pages uh, for Dickens novels. And I just wondered, um, I just wondered, was, was the sort of that representation of Scott bringing together all the characters or all the objects and sort of cluttering them onto a title page or into a publication, was that the sort of trend, the beginning of that trend or, or, or um, and then Dickens sort of, and his publishers follow, or was that something that goes far um, further back than Scott? I don't know. To be, com to be completely honest, I don't, I don't know. Um, I'm not particularly familiar with il um, Dickens' illustrated works. Um, maybe? I, I mean, Scott obviously predates him, but um, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I can't speak more expansively on that. <laughs> um, do we have any any anyone else wanting to ask a question? Oh, I'll pipe in then with 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 with, with one slightly hashed together at the last minute for you, Lillian. Um, I absolutely these illustrations you were showing were fabulous. I particularly loved the the wee boys. Um, playing at playing at um, uh, having a tour. <laughs> absolutely wonderful picture. Uh, took me right back to a childhood I never had. Um, but um, something that really did uh, strike me was in these depictions of Scott. Well, sorry, of sorry of the great unknown, um, carrying all these books and so on, always dressed as this sort of uh, uh, fully tartan bedecked. Um, mm -hmm. big muscly person and um, of course um, Scott by this point had had um, orchestrated your divorce visit um, he hadn't come out as the author of Waverley but it was I suppose one of the worst kept secrets um, <laughs> around I presume um, but it, it made me think to um, just the role of the, of the theatrical representations of the Waverley novels mm -hmm. in sort of in, in maybe actually uh, spelling out some of these visual tropes that, that, that we see. So, you know, from 18, already as early as uh, 1815, you're already getting stations of Guy Manor, uh, stations of Guy Mannering, I think. And then Rob Roy really takes off. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and yeah, so I, I wonder, A, how much are you looking into the theatrical adaptations? And the and and the um, and their kind of input into this visual imaginary that you're pulling on later, and uh, 
B, do you think it, yeah, do you think, if you have looked into it, do you think it's got a, 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 a an interesting role perhaps? Yeah, I mean, I think it has a hugely important role. So um, uh, one of the chapters in my thesis is actually about a theatrical adaptation of The Heart of Midlothian. Um, but I think it's great that you were able to note the, um, the stance of Scott in, in one of those satirical prints is imitating the, uh, a very famous pose that I think his name was McRady. Um, Mc, oh, I'm probably butchering that, but he, he was, I, I think he was in the, he was like the, um, the best actor that that um, did a rendition of Rob Roy and the pose that he's striking in that satirical print is actually a pose that was of the actor that was sort of redistributed as the play was becoming popularized. So yeah, it's this really interesting um, conflation of like authorial identity and like theatrical adaptation. And the, <laughs> the other thing that of course is so confusing or troubling about those prints is the fact that he's wearing, uh, uh, you know, a kilt, <laughs> which Scott was from the border. So like he, he wouldn't have worn a kilt ever. But again, it's, I, I, it's I kind of goes back to what Ewan was saying earlier about this repackaging and rebranding of Scott through lots and lots of different formats and how they all just sort of become, confused and overlap each other and um, I think theater was hugely important to the popularization of of his work um, so the chapter that I wrote on on this theatrical adaptation of Heart of Midlothian was about um, the backdrops to the play um, the backdrops to the play were painted by Alexander Naismith, who um, is considered by many one of the sort of founding fathers of the school of Scottish landscape um, painting. And again, it's this really unique sort of combination of things happening all at once, but this production, this particular production of The Heart of Midlothian garnered a lot of critical attention and, and acclaim for having these really fantastic backdrops. And in fact, in a lot of the 19th century press coverage for this play, um, critics discussed how this was um, a perfect um, portrait exhibition of Scott's works and it was a gallery of Scott's works and um, so again it's it's lots of, I use the term media ecology a lot in my work but again because it sort of refers to all of these things sort of feeding off each other and creating what we could very much call a sort of literary phenomenon um, so yeah I think theater was very, very important to to that. Thank you very much for, for, for your answer there. Um, there's, there's so much there, and especially in this striking of the, the pose that you, that you bring up. That's, uh, I'm reminded as well, there's, there's, there's a grave in Edinburgh um, amongst our exceptional, many exceptional graves uh, to the, the chap whose name I forget. Who is the, the sort of standout uh, performer of Nicole Jarvie? Um, that's uh, definitely worth a, a visit as well. Um, has anyone any further questions? Well, I suggest uh, what I'll do is I'll um, thank you very much for taking these questions, uh, Lillian. I'll pass us all back to into Ian's very capable hands briefly, and uh, and and we'll take it from there. Lillian, thank you very, very much. Um, ju and just before I hand you or, or invite uh, Professor Penny Fielding to give her vote of thanks, um, I'm just building very slightly on what Michael just said. Um, 
Scott had such a love for the human voice and the varieties of um, the voices from Scotland that in a sense is very difficult, I think, to keep them on the page. They lend themselves to a dramatic presentation. Um, anyhow, th this, is, this is extremely interesting and very enjoyable. Um, Penny, may I, do you mind if I ask if you could give a vote of thanks, please? Of course. So Lillian, thank you very much for giving us such a fascinating talk um, that really helps us uh, to understand the many and various currents that went into creating uh, and then preserving Scott's fame and his popularity in the 19th century. And I'm sure everyone will agree with me that we could not have asked for a better talk in these difficult and, and remote circumstances when we can't be together for talks. Uh, your, your beautiful uh, sequence of uh, illustrations uh, brought all the material to life so well. And they and your talk showed how uh, ingrained Scott had become in the visual imagination of the, of the Victorian period. Um, and you blended that perfectly with um, the way he was also a repository of national memories in his lifetime. Uh, and I really uh, loved the transition you made from Scott's own cut conjuring of images uh, to his afterlife and the way the visual imagination continued. Uh, I'm sure we all have our own uh, pictures of the characters in the novels and the illustrations you showed us can only add to this. Although I'm not sure that I could read Ivanhoe again without thinking of Ivanhoe and Bois Gilbert as small boys <laughs> fighting each other. And while we can't at the moment uh, in the pandemic go to Abbotsford, it was wonderful to view it uh, at a distance uh, from your a splendid evocation and perhaps the the virtual travelers that you described might have understood a little bit uh, our current plight but of course they would not have had such a detailed and interesting compendium both of images and of ideas that you've shown us tonight so on behalf of the club uh, thank you very much indeed oh, thank you thank you <laughs> And um, uh, many apologies for coming back to me once again, uh, but <clears throat> of course, thank you, Penny. Thank you, Lillian. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, all of you, for coming along this evening and for um, being part of this, uh, as I said again, a very exciting moment for us as the club. Um, and indeed, we actually managed to have an audience uh, from very far and wide this evening, um, which is not something we necessarily managed to do on your average Thursday in Edinburgh. So thank you very much for making that happen. Um, now, this is um, just one final thing before we go. This is um, uh, the first time uh, that we'll be doing this, of course, and most likely not the last. So if you have an opportunity and have something you'd like to share with me about um, ways in which you'd like to um, improve the experience or things you thought worked particularly well, or, um, please do just send me an email and we'll, we'll look at how we can optimize this for all of us uh, uh, to enjoy at its very best. But um, once again, thank you very much. Thank you, Lillian. Uh, thank you all. I'll see you soon.